had delivered this just a few weeks ago as part of our College of Applied Engineering series. It's a, uh, offered by the CH Tumhill University, and typically they have learning opportunities every one to two weeks. And many of our TBG colleagues may or may not be familiar with the, the College of Applied Engineering. So I kind of want to keep that wrapper on it. But it is, uh, the, today's presentation is turning BIM on its side. So I appreciate everyone joining today. I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to put all the participants on mute. And at the end of the session, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Just one moment. The As leader I has muted your line. As I mentioned, just uh, uh, this is Jane Alden. I uh, recently transferred to Southern California office earlier this summer. I'm a member of our TBG Global uh, Group, leading our design automation and visualization team. And our teams focus on working with project teams to integrate design automation and visualization technologies during project pursuits and execution of project delivery. And those projects can range from traditional consulting, large programs like the London 2012 Olympics, and many of the design build pursuits and deliverables that we're uh, working on as a, as a business group. Um, I was fortunate to begin my career, just a quick snapshot in construction, working for the Illinois Department of Transportation as a civil engineer. And after the cold, blistery winters, I transitioned to uh, uh, internally to design, highway design and roadway design for about 13 years. And for the last 10 years at East Tom Hill, my energies have been focused on leading design automation for TBG. And I've been quite fortunate to have tremendous opportunities to utilize the construction, design, and automation skills on numerous projects here at CH with many of you. So thank you very much. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. Similar to College of Applied Engineering, for these sessions, if you want professional development hours, you have to go into My Learning and sign up and register. And at conclusion, then you'll have to go and complete the, uh, the registration or the little uh, survey. And Denise Kennedy has sent that information with part of all those TV uh, colleagues. And I can forward that information if you need it as well. So this is a high level uh, presentation today to kick off a learning series. We'll have five sub subsequent sessions. And you can see the dates that these are offered. I appreciate everyone's flexibility with the, uh, the lateness in the announcement that came on Friday and many of you received on Monday. We have another session planned for Thursday. And typically, we offer these at 12 noon Eastern time, followed by 12 noon Pacific time. And Denise is also recording these. So they'll be linked and posted on the TBG technology page. So again, these are the offerings that we have. This coincides with our deployment of the Bentley Civil G8i Select Series 2 deployment. So you're going to see a lot of new tools over the course of the next six weeks and how these integrate into our uh, design automation delivery. So today's presentation, we'll take a look at turning BIM on its side to demonstrate the integration of a suite of design automation tools to, de to develop an intelligent model and how that model can be used from concept, planning, design, construction, and operation. So most often, I am, oftentimes I'm, I'm asked, what does BIM mean? And most often people think of building information modeling. So we all occupy buildings either at home or at work. We can see all the elements that make up that building from the architectural, structural, mechanical, electrical, and obviously the comforting things, the furniture, as we occupy the building. We bring all these elements or components together into a single combined model. This is most often thought of as BIM. Well, interestingly enough, not only is the industry, transportation, agency as a whole, but many government agencies have added their own interpretation of what BIM means. Well, obviously, we've heard of BIM, Building Information Modeling. Many of the vendors, software vendors, have ta talked about Transportation Information Modeling, or TRIM, Bridge Information Modeling, or BRIM, Facilities Information Modeling, or FIM, and not to be left, last but not least, 
civil information modeling or SIM. But at the end of the day, SIM means different things to different people. For me, it's talking about building an intelligent model. That's my view of it. I take all the different industries out. It's about an intelligent model. So we take a look at it. David Fouché from our CFI group had a really unique perspective on this. He's very creative, very talented um, user of many of the applications from the architectural and GFI perspective. And his take on this was very unique. He said, let's take building, changing it from a noun to a verb for the action of this. And the reason we really want to focus on that from a transportation side, if we take that building and lay it down on its side, often we think of that as more of a bridge. So I've got my little highway design perspective. And if we look at this, some might say this is a very old uh, technology that we're looking at, the covered bridge. But if you take a look at it, it's a very intricate system. And it actually is an intelligent model. There's a lot of components in here. There's a lot of attribution on those components that we could actually make an intelligent model. But we need to spring forward to today and look towards the future. And often for our competitors, we always take a look at, on the virtual office, we like to take a look at competitors watch. We can, we can watch our editors in the transportation industry alone and see where their focus is. They've got teams focused not only on engineering, but they've got teams focused on building an intelligent model for traditional consulting and, more importantly, for our design build. So we need to make the future now. So when we look, take a look at intelligent modeling, we can harvest that data from the model and apply it to a number of useful applications the center hub being building that intelligent model. So it starts with the 3D design and modeling. We can take it through the life cycle of a project from concept or sketch to full-blown engineering assessment. We can use different analytical tools from structural, electrical, lighting, analyze that model, even take a look at looking at all the intricate systems that we're developing and designing, taking a look and assessing whether there's any potential conflicts for clash detection or interferences between all of our existing facilities and our design facilities. We can then even extend it to do automated drawing or contract plan generation from plan view, profile view, section view. Again, we're driving upon that, building upon that model and using it for a number of useful applications. We can even bring our project team members into the BIM process so they can collaborate and walk through the model and look for potential errors, conflicts. They can even make notations. Continue on to leverage that model for extracting or harvesting quantities. We can annotate or um, link specific specifications to different components of that model. And as we continue on from a construction standpoint, we can even simulate construction activity, align it with timelines, kind of a time lapse, and, and taking it further to complete in place, so can we visualize, building upon that model, can we visualize what we're actually going to have complete in place when the contractor leaves the project? Again, taking a look at that, an intelligent model and using it through the life cycle of the project. So let's begin. We've got the intelligent model built. Subsequent sessions will go through various tools on how to build that intelligent model. But let's take a look at some useful applications. We'll start with the analytical side that some of our uh, project teams can take advantage of. We're going to uh, showcase a couple different highway design applications. Now, this is just a sample technique that can be applied to many other different design situations. Here we're looking, you can see we've got a highway facility that goes from left to right, and we've got an exit ramp as you're traveling from east to west or from right to left on the page. We've got an orange line that represents the required decision site distance. This is the distance that a driver needs as they're drive, traveling on that freeway to safely maneuver to make that exit. That's the distance they need to see in advance. We can take some of these same techniques and apply it to intersections or corner site distance. Oftentimes, as I'm driving on arterial streets, I look and say, how much of that vegetation is really obstructing me from safely crossing the street? Oftentimes when I'm driving, I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking of a BIM model in my head. We can use it for barrier obstructions at the intersections as well. So we've got a lot of useful applications. This is just one example. So here's the, a standard 
highway designer experience. Now we're going to take a look at, we've published that model in a 3D CAD environment. So you can see the, the graphic down below. I've superimposed that decision site distance line. I tried to do it in a different color in blue so you could see it a little bit better. And again, so we're going to take a look at, we have this command preference where we can come in and say, based on the height of the eye, the height of the object, can you clearly see in advance of that exit to safely maneuver off the freeway? We can even take this information and publish it to a navigator so we can actually experience it like you would be driving that facility. So I'm taking off an ADI. We publish that. We're going to drive along the outside, that outside lane. And as we're traveling along that facility, I purposely didn't superimpose this model onto existing terrain. I wanted you to see the general relief of this project. So there's pretty significant fills, followed by as we get as we start to turn that corner in advance of that exit ramp, you can see there's a pretty substantial cut, very high cut. So the question I would have is do we need to lay back that cut even further to make sure it's not an obstruction so I can safely make that maneuver as I'm driving down the freeway? So you can see it's pretty significant. It kind of looks like a little steep little hat as you're driving around here. And it's starting to come into view as we're driving down this facility. We start to see that blue line. So I'm using this from a visual perspective. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this and say, is there anything that's conflicting with this? So again, I'm just kind of getting this sense of driving this facility. I can use also additional tools to see if there's any actually physical interferences or obstructions. So again, just trying to give you a sense of how can you take your 3D design model, quickly do an assessment of it using some of these tools. So again, I pushed it to Navigator so I can actually get this sense of driving that facility. I'll go ahead and let me cancel out of this viewport. And we'll go back to the PowerPoint slide. So again, we're taking that design model, leveraging it for an analytical purposes. As we continue on, I want to show you another example. I could take that same one and do a class detection, but I want to show you another example that's pretty common. A lot of us civil designers work on gravity-driven systems. You can see at this inter interchange, we've got a drainage cross culvert crossing from basically from upper left to lower right, crossing the freeway, and it also has, it crosses over an electrical line. It's a high voltage line. You can see the orange arrow kind of showing that lateral crossing. The question is, what's happening vertically? Well, I can go ahead and take advantage of some of these tools to help me assess. I'm going to take this information. My drainage system was designed horizontally and vertically. I'll display it in 3D. I can take the electrical whether it be existing or proposed, basically assign it an elevation. I can drape it and drop it off of my existing surface or off my proposed surface. I'm going to take this information and, again, take advantage of Navigator to go and look for hard interferences where things physically conflict or maybe what I call a soft interference if I need to buffer something. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. And I know on, on some systems when I'm running the AVIs, it may be a little slow because of your internet connection, so hopefully you guys can see this information. We'll have it posted so you can go out later and take a look at the AVI. So I'm launching this file from ProjectWise, opening it with Navigator. I've published this 3D information, used iModel to publish it to a format that I could use Navigator for class detection. I'm going to come in and establish the rules. I'm going to say, what do you want to check? I want to check the electrical facility. It's on level 26. Check it against a physical obstruction or interference with drainage facilities on level 36. I'm going to come in. If I want to change and add buffers, I could. But at this point, I said, just show me if they're physically touching or interfering. So I do a process, and it says no clash is detected. So no physical hard interferences. Well, now I know I'm talking with the project manager. The utility company is quite concerned. They'd like to see a one-foot buffer around that electrical facility. I'm going to change the criteria. I'm going to add a second set of rules and process this one with the one foot of buffer around that electrical facility. Now tell me if anything is conflicting or touching. And I do have a class detection. So it detected possible conflict based on the rules that I assigned. So you can see the red facility is that electrical duct bank that's shown there in 3D. And again, I have the ability to just kind of hover over, turn things on and off. So it's kind of nice. It's really easy interface to navigate. So 
I'm looking at 3D, I can come in and make a note. So let's say I'm working with one of my colleagues, Shannon designed this, and I said, well, hey, based on this criteria, I think we need to make an adjustment on that gravity-driven system. So I'm going to go ahead and make a note. I can come in and use typical like Adobe markup PDF tools. It's very similar to Word tools. I can come in and make a note. Hey, based on the buffer, I think we're going to need to make an adjustment here. So I make some notations. I can even cloud it so she can see this as she gets into the edit mode, make it a little easier for her to navigate. And if I go back into the traditional kind of twist to review mode, it actually puts like what I call like a little Google Earth uh, flag. So again, if I hide that, I go ahead and close the clash detection interface, I can see that little flag there. It's a notation. If I hover over it, you can see the markups that were uh, assigned there. So again, you can click on that and go and see the rules that were based or developed for that clash detection, whether it's hard interference or soft interference. So again, it's a pretty cool tool, quick and dirty. I don't need to have all the skill set to know how that all that content was published in 3D, but I can quickly, as a senior reviewer, use these tools to look for potential conflicts. Go ahead and close that ABI. Step back into the PowerPoint. So again, we're taking that intelligent model. We're using it for multiple purposes. Obviously, as I develop that model, and I get it to a certain point, I'm ready to produce some drawings. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and use some automated tools to generate potentially plan views, profile views, and section views. So oftentimes our civil engineering team will take a look at this and can use a combination of plan and profile views. We've got automation tools that can label the models with intelligent notes, what I like to call smart notes. And the nice thing about these smart notes, they can be the content of those smart notes can be synchronized or updated when the engineering content is changed. So if I raise that profile, I can have it update those notes accordingly. So what you can see from this graphic, this is a project that was done for one of our design builds in the state of Utah. And we tried to showcase as we were rolling these tools out to the project team what was going to be fully automated, what would be manually edited. 95% of this content on this one plan sheet and this grouping of profile sheets was fully automated. The only annotation that was not automated was that little the information that was shaded in purple along the top left and right, so the super elevation diagram. But all the other content was annotated with a variety of inroads tools. And we'll go to the next slide to show you the the command palette. Now the nice thing about this, we're seeing a convergence on the Bentley Civil Suite. So inroads, Geopack, and MX that's used worldwide. MX is mostly in Europe and Australia. But across North America, we see the convergence of predominant use of inroads and Geopack with Select Series 2, V8i. These tools and workflows are coming together. So you can transfer your Geopack skills to work on inroads projects or vice versa, take your inroad skills and apply them to Geopack projects. So you're starting to see convergence on their tool sets. They're still backwards compatible, so if you have old workflows, you can bring them forward, but you're probably going to want to step ahead with the new tools and learn new workflows. So here's the command dialog you can see to generate the sheet, what we call the plan and profile generator, or PMP is kind of our nickname we give it. We've got the automated drafting notes. So the smart notes, and then there's profile annotation, which not is only limited to vertical annotation, there's a whole wealth of information that you can annotate on these plan sheets. Oftentimes on projects, you might have a profile sheet that is for your notebook, your digital design notebook, so you'll have all your design detailed information, which is different than what you might publish to the contractor. So again, you have the ability to annotate two sets of drawings, one for your digital design notebook, one for the contractor to build off of. So I'm going to kick off an AVI that we uh, generated for a project dip in Idaho, based on Idaho Transportation Department. They've got some really good uh, command preferences set up. And this project is using alternating full plan and full profile sheets. So we've already created the plan viewports, but now we're just going to walk through and customize the alternating profile sheets. So you can see there we've got the plan sheets already created. Now we're going to go through the steps. 
of making this project specific. So we're doing it for the westbound of I-90. We're going to come in and give it the parameters to say, how do you want to set up those profile sheets? Well, we need to name each of the profile sheets. So we give it a starting name, and I'll alternate and put a suffix 1, 2, 3, 4, so profile sheet, plan sheet, and so forth. We're also going to tell it what seed file to use to start with. Well, this is Idaho Transportation Department. We need to use one of their seed files. We're going to tell it what border to use. So this is specific to the project. So we're going to tell it where to find that border file. We can even tell it to automate the population of the title block. So fill in the title block for it. It's going to fill in title block information for the title of the sheet, but also design by, check by, anything that you want. You can even tell it to give start and stop stations on a per sheet basis. So there's a lot of intelligent notes that inroads your geopack could populate on here. I'm going to add in some symbols where to place the north arrow. Even tell it to label the match lines, both left and right sides. So we're going to go ahead and kick off this. It's going to go through a process, create a little profile viewport, and then one by one, systematically, it's going to create the plan sheet and profile sheet. So again, I, I skipped ahead to a couple to save some time here, but we're going to go and view the second sheet in the series, so the plan sheet. We'll zoom in on this so you guys can take a look at that left match line. Window in there, you can see it automatically populated that information, pulling the intelligence data to station. We'll do the same thing on the right side. Again, this is per ITD standard, so per your client standard, this can be customized pretty easily. We'll zoom in on the pro or the title block area, and you can see, again, intelligent information, as well as design, design by, check by information. Then we'll step into the profile sheet, corresponding profile sheet, and you can see it extracted that information. It labeled the information for the horizontal and vertical datum, so stationing as well as the elevation along that grid line. It went pretty quickly, so my apologies. Hopefully it's keeping pace with you guys on the uh, on the live meeting. So we'll step out of that AVI, <coughs> excuse me, and go back into PowerPoint. So again, we're taking that model, we're leveraging it. Now we've extracted information to automate not only plan view, profile view, but we can also do cross sections. We're going to take this and now we're going to bring in our project team and our client to help us collaborate, bring them into the BIM process. BIM is more than just vertical, it can be horizontal construction as well. So we're going to allow them to collaborate and use this model for a design review perspective. So we've got some examples where we showed how to use it for analytical, for potential um, interferences. We'll use this for design review, for our senior technical reviews. Now, before we step into this, the School of Technology has, has worked with the Discipline Best Practice League. They, cross, they span all business groups, and they develop presentations that focus on design quality. So I think if you can couple these tools together with some of their overriding guiding principles that they document, how to check uh, the checking process for engineering and architectural disciplines, these two things coupled together will really help our project team to jumpstart and hit the ground running. So not everyone may be comfortable using these tools, so we have a, a couple of variety of formats that you can use. So you can use a 3D PDF, or you can use a navigator format. But again, this allows the engineer or reviewer to visualize or literally walk through the design in a realistic manner. In essence, to me, it brings the 2D plans into a 3D world. So you can take this model and use it for an interactive cross-discipline design review. So I could be sitting there with a the contractor, I could be sitting there with the drainage guys, the structures guys, the geotech folks, looking all of these pieces together, and we can walk through this and mark up our models. Trust me, our competitors are doing it. We need to do it as well. So as we look at this, this is a project that was uh, we were pursuing in the city of San Francisco. You can see we have a look. We have a uh, undercrossing. We have this road traveling underneath the mainline facility, and it turns and heads to the east and then wraps up and then joins into the mainline. We're going to use some modeling techniques to make sure that we have adequate vertical site, uh, vertical clearance during construction. I'm going to go ahead and kick off the Navigator AVI. And a couple of things that we did on the modeling of this, we integrated components that aren't necessarily design components from an inroad standpoint. So you can see we're going to go ahead and slide into this cross street, 
And we're going to literally kind of walk through this cross street. We're going to drive down along it, kind of walk down through it. You can see the basic elements that make up the roadbed and the barrier along each side of it. And then the, the, the fill slopes or the cut slopes behind it. Now, as we approach this bridge that crosses over, we've actually got some components that we integrated to the template. The orange components that look like little vertical steps are, is, represents the 16 and a half foot vertical clearance. We've also got yellow components that lie directly underneath the soft foot of that bridge for false work clearance. So we want to make sure as you're driving along this facility that we have adequate clearance. And you can see part of those orange and yellow, the orange components actually cut into that road bed. So during construction, we don't have adequate vertical clearance on this facility. So we need to come back and make an adjustment. Again, it's a unique tool, taking a different twist on how to apply the modeling tool. Traditionally, we always think complete in place. But let's add in some additional components to the template that will help facilitate design review and checking of our own work. So again, just kind of spinning along here and taking a look at those components. <clears throat> so as we continue on, as we continue to enhance design, planning and design is an iterative process. We continue to go around that BIM wheel and enhance our design. We've made the changes, incorporated any review comments. We're at the point where we're ready to extract those quantities and feed those off to the cost estimating team. So again, we have the ability with the civil suite of tools to do that. So we're going to go ahead and step into, I'm showing you here today, on the inroad side. But the, again, the convergence of the Bentley civil tools, we get to a certain point, the workflow will extract the quantities from each of the models one from GeoCab, one from Inroads, but harvesting those and computing quantities will become the same workflow. So again, you're seeing the convergence, the crossover, and the application of consistent set of tools and skills that you can use on either platform. So I've got some screen captures here. So the nice thing about this on the Inroads side, we'll showcase GeoCab in subsequent sessions, is you can work from the pull-down menu from top to bottom. So we're going to set up your pay item database. If you're working for Idaho Transportation Department, they've got a pay item database developed. There's a listing of all their bid item codes, the bid item descriptions, how you're going to measure them, how you're going to pay for them. So what's included, what's not included. If you don't, you can start with kind of what I would call your David Letterman top ten. Start with a small subset. What's the most laborious, what's the most risk? Let's build those pay items. How are you going to measure them, how are you going to pay them? And right now I'm going to show you a very simple Example, concrete sidewalk. We've got two bid items there, and one for a four-inch thick sidewalk, one for a six-inch side, six thick sidewalk. That's tough to say. We're going to measure those in a square area, square footage, because this is an English project, it's a square feet. We're going to take this information, assign some shapes, and say, here's the area where that concrete sidewalk will be constructed. Now go measure that pull it out to a database, and then we can then carve it up and say, who's going to pay for what? So we can either quantify that for an estimating purpose, show a little table on the contract plan. So let's go take a look at the uh, quantity AVI. So again, we'll just kind of walk through the process. Again, we're focusing on that same interchange. We're going to zoom in, and we're going to isolate the layers that just represent the concrete sidewalk. So turning off all the display of the reference files and just focusing on the shapes that represent the concrete sidewalk. So I've opened up the pay item database, and again, I can go and inspect each of the pay item databases. I can, I've got this first pay item, pay item, and again, it just shows the pay item number, pay item description, and the unit of measure. So square feet based on an area. So the first thing I need to do is come in and say, what shapes represent the limits of that concrete sidewalk? So again, it's just prompting me to go through and identify those and it's like a flood or region command in AutoCAD or MicroStation. You can see it's highlighting each of those shapes. In this one workflow, I'm dumping it into an inroad digital terrain model. Non-triangulated features, I could also use it a different way. I could use it from a basis of my design model, from my roadway designer. Just a different way. I can do it from a master file, or I can do it from a model. So this is just one example. So I'm coming in, and I'm going to place a fence. I'm going to use the, uh, I'm going to tell it to go ahead and compute those quantities. 
So I could do it based on a per cent basis, per sheet basis for the entire project. So I have a lot of flexibility depending on what my client needs. So I'm going to generate an access database that's going to populate all this information. I'm going to tell it to generate information along a baseline so then I can then report this information on my plans from station and offset. So I've generated that. And the nice thing about this, it gives me a visual coloring so I can visually verify that all the concrete sidewalk was, was captured. So it extracted that. It's harvesting it. Now I'm going to go open it up in a um, quantity manager. So with quantity manager, this is the convergence of inroads and geopacks for the quantity extraction. Both of these workflows are exactly the same. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to report on each individual bid item. I've just done one for this example. And then I can generate different types of reports. I can generate in CSV format, PDF, you name it. You can customize this to meet your needs. Some of our clients, like ITD or other uh, DOTs, have their own custom report format. I'm going to go ahead and generate this. And it's writing it out to a CSV file. So again, it's something I can then use in Excel. I could link that Excel table to my contract plan. I could link it to, link it to my engineer's estimate. And the really cool thing with Estimator, Transoft Estimator, I can even partition and say a certain percentage is going to be funded by the city, a certain percentage funded by the county, and a certain percentage funded by the state. So you can allocate funding resources to all those quantities as well. Again, it depends on the scope, scope of your project. If, if that need arises, you have that flexibility to do so. I'll go ahead and close this. And beyond, step them back into the PowerPoint. Again, so we're continuing to leverage that model going forward with Select Series 1, BI, Select Series 2, excuse me. We can take that model and use it for linkage to our specification. Showing you here in some of our market segments, we may use the Enterprise CAD standard enterprise specification. Again, for some market segments, many of our DOT market segments or DOT clients have their own specification. If you're linking from our enterprise specs, you can take them in project-wise, copy them over to your project-wise project, and we can even establish an intelligent linkage from a model to that specification. So again, if you're working on something and say I'm collaborating with Shannon, and I want to know, what's see, how are we going to measure and pay for this? What's the specification associated with this retaining wall, a concrete barrier? I can click on that within the model and see that information intelligently. I can bring these together. I can package the whole entire plan, specs, and estimate using PWPlot. So it's not only PWPlot or IPlot. It's no longer limited to just AutoCAD or MicroStation. It can publish other content from traditional Microsoft Office products as well. So again, just want to kind of show you that going forward. We'll dive into the details in subsequent sessions. That's scheduling. Scheduling can be you can take that model, and you can even associate a time lapse to it. So I can take that and say, let's show the construction of the different of the bridge elements in a kind of a construction sequence format. Or I can even visualize and publish that complete in place model, so then I can then take it to the client, maybe even go into a public meeting and say, this will give you the sense of what this facility will look like once we're done with construction. So I've got an example here, a very innovative solution that Tim Newman and his colleagues worked on on a pursuit in the state of Utah. Many of you have seen it, but again, I just wanted to represent the majority of this was published from the engineering model, that intelligent model, and then stood up with a high-end visualization tool by Glenn Dombrowski. So again, this was a pretty beefy visualization. There may be a little bit of lag in some of your the remote offices here, but I'm going to kick this off. There's a couple things. There's a lot of wow factors to this. This was used to generate this innovative engineering solution, diverging diamond solution in Utah, and bringing it up. And so you can see the content. This was published from an engineering model. So all the roadway improvements, the grading, all the concrete elements, those were published from an inroads model. Pushed over into visualization so then they can make this realistic so they can understand here's the concept, the engineering concept. That Tim proposed, you know, we're going to create a diverging diamond, move the traffic from the traditional driving on the right side to the left side, improve safety 
improve traffic operations, and as you head west, move them back over to the right side of the road. So again, it gives you the sense, here's the change in, con in a traditional engineering concept. Here's how it's going to look, how it's going to operate. So at a high level, now to sell this to some of the people on the ground, literally then drove it like you would be driving as a, as a driver or as a passenger. How would you experience this? So again, you give you the, the sensation of how this would operate. So I'm driving up, I approach the intersection. Oh, I can see the red signal. Need to stop. Let all the traffic safely pass through the intersection. As soon as the light turns green, car gets through, then I can continue on. But again, this was a concept that was developed and driven off that intelligent engineering model. So we'll go ahead and let it uh, finish out. Again, I hope, uh, hope everyone can uh, see this over the light meet. into our PowerPoint slideshow mode. So covered a lot of information in a very short time frame. So a couple things that I want to uh, reference is some resources for everybody. So we've stood up and we've enhanced our TBG Design Automation SharePoint site. I know with the reworking of the virtual office, many of you may have lost your books and forgot how to navigate. We'll go ahead and show you how to get here. A couple things that I wanted to point out, and this is based on our colleagues' feedback people using the site and going out and navigating it, how can we improve the navigation of it? So a couple things as we walk through here. Um, as we go through on this next slide, you can see we've got the top navigation bar. So again, we're trying to provide consistency from SharePoint site to SharePoint site. So we organize this top navigation bar, kind of like the tabs on an Excel workbook. You can click on a tab, it takes you to a new web page or SharePoint. And we've organized that in a traditional project delivery perspective. So you can go from left to right. So what's the big vision of our intelligent or integrated design automation delivery? How are we going to get there from a communication where you're going to share and possibly post some discussion board items, any new announcements, the project automation lead role, person stewarding automation on your project, helping drive the delivery of that integrated design automation aspects of the project and so forth. I've selected the document management tab, and you can see in the viewport below, I've got a screen capture. So you can see this is document management system. You can see we announced in the very first week of this year, as a firm, we're migrating to project-wise and all new projects. We've got a wealth of new tools and workflows and documented items to help our project teams walk through that process of integrating project-wise on their projects, on new projects in particular. So again, trying to make this streamline for project teams on how to navigate organizing the content in a, uh, in a fashion that's easy to consume. Again, trying to get feedback from folks. From the home page, we also try to integrate. You can see those shiny blue icons. So we're trying to bring a wealth of information together for the different market segments within transportation. You can see them all listed there. You can click on one of those, and it'll bring up a new web page. And we did that explicitly so you wouldn't get buried between one web page and not know how to navigate back. It opens up a new page for you. And you can see here I've clicked on the, the little icon for the train. And if I do that, there's a couple elements that we tried to bring together. We tried to bring almost four different viewports together. We have the traditional planning and design viewport on the left for each of the COPs. So for transit and rail, you can see that it's highlighted in the box. Then on the right side, we're bringing elements of design automation, specific learning series elements, and quality management system items related to rail design and planning and rail design automation. So we're trying to make this a viewport. If you're more focused on transit and rail, you kind of a one-stop shop. Get you here where you can actually navigate and see all this content. So as the chief engineer for rail and transit updates the content on the left, you always be up to date on this information from this one viewport. That, uh, from the home page, down at the bottom, we have these shiny green icons. So again, it gives you access to a wealth of tools across the enterprise. So we've got our COP, um, Center for Project Excellence, Design Automation, so the enterprise design automation tools 
you can click on that link, School of Technology. So again, from Seacomb Hill University, you can go to specifically technology or project delivery or project management, but School of Technology will drive into the technical practice. So, and then e-learning has been rebranded to e-tutor. You can select on that, and it'll take you directly to that. So again, you don't have to worry about remembering or uh, creating bookmarks for all these items. From the TBG Design Animation site, click on the link, and it'll take you directly there. The calendar will show you a listing of all the TBG uh, offerings, live meetings, sessions, and learning series. Discussion boards, if you want to collaborate with your colleagues. If we click on e-learning, you can see the rebranding of that site. And again, there's a wealth, of, it's a library of AVIs, uh, workflows, uh, data sets that you can walk through and learn based on a wealth of content. For today's presentation, all of the content has been organized under an intelligent design area. If you go ahead and click on that filter and click on that tab, you can see to the right it brought up a viewport, and you can see all the content listed by all the different course offerings. I've highlighted the four primary areas that we've covered today, and we're going to get into greater detail on project examples in the next five sessions. But again, you can see there's roughly 142 uh, course offerings for Bentley Civil, for Inroads XM and V8I, the Fundamentals class. So if you haven't had a chance to attend instructor-led training, here's self-paced training. You can go out and go through all these different um, courses, flash detection, design review, the navigator. So again, these are self-serve, kind of on demand. Most of the courses range from anywhere from 30 seconds to maybe one to two minutes, trying to keep it easy, consumable. You can do probably a couple courses in five to ten minutes. So if you need to know something on demand, you can click on it and go. School of Technology, so you can see here, not only is this the area where College of Applied Engineering is stored, but the School of Technology. So again, you can start to see all these elements. Discipline Best Practice Lead, where they post their content. So these are more presentation-oriented, where eTutor is more teach you how, so teaching you the basic workflows and the steps. So again, one of the key things that I wanted to try and describe is, you know, BIM is scalable to meet your project needs. It's not one size fits all. It can depend on the size and scope of your project. But again, if you start to build that intelligent model, you can immediately see the multiple uses and applications that you can use for that intelligent model. For me, the biggest thing that I get from this is quality. Quality from cross-discipline checks, from interference checks, from checking my quantity. Oftentimes when I've worked in design projects, the way I can check my design, do I have any errors or omissions? When I start to do quantity, hmm, I haven't adequately communicated on the plans, all of that, what I want the contractor to build. So I can use this intelligent model to start to build those elements and really draw upon that intelligent model to help drive my quality and help drive the delivery. So again, one of my colleagues always used to say, Jane, we need to teach people how to fish. I kind of scratched my head and I said, well, see, what do, you, what do you mean? He goes, well, if you come and knock on my door and say, Jane, can you fix me dinner tonight? He goes, I can fix your dinner tonight. But then tomorrow, you what happens when you're hungry? Because I need to start to teach you the skills so you can start to fish on your own. He was the first couple times you're not, you may not be very good at or you may need some help. He was, but you're going to start to grow those skills. So again, today, as we start to dig into the details, we're hopeful that we, you guys will start to grow your skills and learn how to fish. I'm not expecting you to, to, to embrace this all in one day, but again, start to build those skills and start to collaborate with your colleagues. Many of you start to collaborate with your teammates and colleagues around the firm, you realize collectively y'all can grab a lot more fish than you can, can on your own. So a couple things here. I know I've been going pretty quickly here. I want to leave time for questions and answers. So I'm going to take the group off the mute here. See if I can navigate this. We'll open. The leader has unmuted your line. And I know I talked really quick. <laughs> so a couple of things while you all think about any questions you might have, kind of show you how to navigate out to our SharePoint site. So from the Seed Hill Virtual Office homepage, 
So TBG and Water Business Group folks become the operations and facilities and infrastructure. So this includes TBG, Water, and INAT. So we come over here to the facilities and infrastructure. And the nice thing on the left shortcut bar, we can just go ahead and click on transportation. So each of the business groups has had an opportunity to kind of refine their SharePoint sites. We'll go directly into technology, and you can see that they've redone the technology homepage. So again, it has those nice, easy navigation bars or tabs along the top. Along the top, you can see Denise Kennedy as she's working with Kevin Sharp and the other chief engineers on all the course offerings and all the technology learning series. You come right here. You can actually bookmark this and see what courses are being offered. Go ahead and select on the Design Automation tab. It'll bring you directly to our TBG Design Automation SharePoint site. And so from here, you've got a wealth of, of uh, links to all of the information across the entire business group or entire entire company. A couple of things that I'd like to kind of share with you. Eater Tutor has really been growing significant momentum. Last month alone, we had roughly 65,000 hits on eTutor. So your colleagues are finding it useful. If there's additional information that you could benefit from. There's been some uh, eTutor surveys, so please fill those out. The whole point of the use that site is to help us deliver our work, help develop our skill sets, help people grow and enhance based on our career development. So I'm going to pause here and see if anybody has any questions. If not, don't be bashful about uh, asking me a question or coming out. If, even if you come over here and uh, go ahead and click on the discussion board, you can share and collaborate with your colleagues. Hey, Jane, this is Robert. Hey, um, Robert. I have a, I did, I, this might be covered in the next one. I noticed, like, you know, in that uh, ABI of the class detection, um, like you have the drainage pipes and the electrical. Um, was that, is the integration so far that it can read inroad storm and sanitary files, or was that something you had to model within microstations, like to get that to work? Yeah, and, and both of those facilities were actually displayed directly from inroad storm and sanitary. So okay. the, Drainage facility was designed and modeled in storm and sanitary. The utility was actually incorporated into the storm drain database, so the SNS database, okay. and giving it a cross-sectional shape. Then we can assign an elevation. So we may have a rough guesstimate, kind of a thumb wiggle. Hey, it's okay, so basically you displayed the inroad storm and sanitary data, and then the visualizer is picking that up. We're, we're publishing it to a 3D. Um, I model, which Navigator can read, and then we can set up the rules for class detection. Okay. Okay, so the link is the 3D I model. Okay. That's all part of Navigator. That's all, okay. 